You know, of all these healing evangelists in the 50s and the 40s, you know, this picture of Oral Roberts is one of my favorites with him laying hands on a guy. He used to sit in a chair and lay hands on people. But there's another guy I want to talk about today, another guy who died when he was 38 years old, but it impacted our nation in a big way. A healing evangelist that died at 38. Who am I talking about? They can only be one person. Jack Coe. Jack Coe. Jack, Jack Coe began preaching in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, in, he was ordained by the Assembly of God, and he had a very short ministry. Right, but the largest tent ministry of any evangelist out there. I mean, he set records. Very controversial, though. <laughs> How yes, was he it was. controversial? <laughs> well, he didn't just go and lay hands on somebody. He smacked So he wasn't them. sitting in a chair. <laughs> yeah, he would rip a goiter off a lady's neck. They were always healed. In fact, he healed so many that he was put in jail. For practicing medicine. Without, without a license. license. <laughs> Man, it wouldn't be great to have him here. Well, it would be to great him. to hear what he had to say. Mm. I would love it. But Greg, I got the next best thing. Jack Coe Jr., his son, here in studio today. And you're going to hear more about what it was like to grow up as Jack Coe Jr. Genesis 26, 18 tells us, Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey, and I am so glad you're with me today because you are in for a treat. You know, we've talked about people from the 1700s. We've talked about uh, everything from the Great Prayer Revival to Azusa Street and how all that happened and what happened with Whitfield. Well, today you're in for a treat because today, right here in front of me in studio, is none other than Jack Coe Jr. Jack. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Now, you've heard that name before, I'm sure. Some of you uh, really know who I'm talking about. Jack Coe was, Jack Coe's father, was a great, great, uh, you would call him a healer, healing evangelist in the 50s. And he's got quite a story. So today, we're going to take you through his life story. We're just going to hit the the highlights, but there are some things that you're going to grab today out of the facts of his life that's going to help you. And you're going to be encouraged. You're going to be enlightened. And listen, this is going to be fun. I can't wait. I have been looking for this ever since we talk, talked together on the phone. Right. And I'm like, please come do the program. So I'm glad you're here. Let's so let's talk about your dad. Born March 11th, 1918. Is that correct? Yes, in Oil City, Pennsylvania. Uh, our family came across on the Mayflower. I wow. got the history. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father then was put in a children's home in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because of my grandfather was a gambler and lost everything, did not come home and tell his wife. And my grandmother found out when they were kicked out of the house. Yeah. So now, help me if I got the story right, because I've read, I've done a little research on, obviously, on, on your, your dad and his... Um, your granddad was having a hard time and parts of the furniture would end up missing because of the gambling problem and so they left. Did they separate at one time? Well, he finally just left, period. He left. And gambled the, all of his fortune away. He was a very wealthy man at one mm -hmm. time. So here he is, your, your, his, your dad's dad had, had left and he's on his own with the mother but then he, he ended up in an orphanage. How did that happen? Well, my mother put him, my grandmother put him in the Tulsa Boys Children's Home because she could not afford to take care of the kids any longer. And, of course, my grandfather was broke because of gambling. So here he is living in an orphanage. He's in, for in a lot of ways, he's lost his parents. And he, he's, he's there, even though they're alive still. And he's, he's really dealing with a lot of rejection at this point. In, when, in his life. Is that right? That's right. And he uh, became a salesman as he grew up. He worked for Singer Sewing Machine Company. Singer Sewing. And was the top salesman. And 
uh, he went to a tent revival in his young days and was standing outside. Do you know, Jack, who was preaching that tent revival? I do not know who was preaching the tent revival. Wouldn't you like to know that one? It would be a great <laughs> one, but it was a, a Nazarene A Nazarene. Meeting. Oh, wow. And uh, so my uh, father was standing outside and he said that he could hear them uh, singing and shouting and he, it's when I guess the Nazarenes were really on fire for God because right. he said it got so interesting that uh, as he began to watch, he s said to himself, I've got to have what they ha have. He was an alcoholic because of uh, drinking so much and all of his life, you know, had been a mess. And so he heard them give the altar call. And he went running from outside the tent into the tent mm -hmm. to the altar. And he didn't know how to pray because how he... Old, how old was he at this point? Uh, he was in his 20s. Early 20s, okay. Yes. Uh, and he, he didn't know how to pray. And so he started saying, God, I don't know what they've got, but whatever they've got, I got to have what they've got. I love that. I love that. I got to have what they got. And so, he, oh, God, give me what they got. And so as he was praying that way, he said he felt something like somebody poured warm oil from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Praise and he started to holler, and I got it, I got, got it, it, hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got and it. And he got drunk on the spirit, <laughs> went home that night hollering, hot dog, I got it, and opened up the front door. And as my grandmother said to my step-granddad, said, it sounds like Jack's drunk again. Yeah. You better go put him to bed. Uh. <laughs> and so my step-grandfather got up and tried to lay him in the bed and he'd sit up in the middle of the bed hollering, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. And he was speaking in another language uh, and my granddad said, I, I've never seen him so drunk. He said, I can't handle him. The next morning when he got up, he went to the breakfast table and he said, uh, can we pray over the food? Well, they've never prayed over food in that house before. And he started praying over the food and got happy at the breakfast table and started to shout and praising God. And so... Now, right there, Jack. What's interesting is he didn't know all the religious language to use. That's why he said, hot dog, I got it. <laughs> That's right. But yet something happened in him. He knew he wanted to thank God for his food the very next morning. Isn't that interesting? When you have a, a revelation of who God is... That got in on the inside of him, and he knew he was thankful. Well, that you are when something That's like right. that happens in your life. Absolutely. I mean, it was a complete change, and he didn't want alcohol anymore. Mm. He, he didn't want to cuss anymore, and he just felt so good on the inside because Jesus had just taken all of his sins away and made him a new creature. That's great. Okay, so now... I, I want to hurry up. I don't want to go too fast, but I want to get to. He was. He went into the armed forces at this point. Is that correct? Or was well, he already in the service? He, he went into the service after he got saved. Right. And uh, they thought he was as crazy and lost his mind. They put him in the nut ward. Right. Because he wouldn't drink and he wouldn't cuss and he wouldn't act like the other soldiers acted. Right. And so they said something's wrong with him. In fact, if you ever read the book, I've got the book. Right. That it's the Jack Coe I know. Right. Is one of the books. And then the other one is the Jack Coe story right. that he wrote. So he, what happened next? He, uh, did he, did he, went, he started working with the church. Well, he started to work in it. First, him and my mother started going to a church. That, and my mother told him, said, uh, you're going to have to you know, learn how to do things. And so the pastor told him, first of all, to clean toilets. Well, he didn't feel like he's called to clean toilets, but my mother told him, well, you need to do, learn to whatever right. he says to be obedient. Then the second thing they did is put him over a two-year-old class. Oh my. Uh, he was home c complaining, and she said, well, you learn how to minister to two-year-olds, then you can learn how to minister to others. And then God just began to use him and, and moved on up to other places. And then he felt called to be an evangelist. You know, the, the thing that uh, is, I think, so interesting about your dad, when I look at the old videos, 
and see. Uh, in fact, I think Oral Roberts called him, um, you know, a mighty man of faith. One of the reckless man, reckless of faith. man of faith. That's what it was. Reckless man of faith, and he didn't just do like we see so many people in churches do: go lay hands and go, let's believe God and you can take it and you're healed. And no, he would go grab. Uh, that if there was a, uh, something on the side of their head, he'd go grab it and take it off and move. He, was, he had the faith of giants. He, he told me all kinds of miracles that took place at that time. You know, I was just probably eight or nine years old, and I was at the tent, and I'd see things, but it, it didn't register like right. it did when somebody began to talk to me. Sure. You know, and I was going to, that was actually my next question. Growing up, um, what is it that, you know, when you think back, and I know you have images of the big tents, what stands out to you about your dad? Well, just the way that he operated and did things. I mean, yeah. he, he, he seemed like he wasn't afraid of anything. Right. And uh, in fact, you know, when he got sick, that's, I, and, and never, it was always a puzzle to me why he got sick right. and couldn't overcome it. But he just would tackle anything. I, I mean, I, I remember one time this woman that came up, he, she had a big tumor in her stomach, it was all swollen up, looked like she was pregnant. But she told him, I remember her telling him, I have a tumor, it's about yeah. the size of a basketball. He hauled off and hit her in the stomach. Oh, man. And it's like that tumor <laughs> popped immediately and her skirt fell off, but she had a slip on, but, yeah. but it fell down. And then I remembered <laughs> one time that he was in the tent and he had somebody in a wheelchair and they rolled him up and he picked him up and he was a big man. Yeah, he was. And, and he took the wheelchair with his foot and kicked it out of the way and holding him up and said, run in the name of Jesus. And he let go of him and they fell. Right. He picked them back up and said, I didn't tell you run uh, to fall. I said, run. They began to pray and he let them go again and they fell. Three times that happened. Wow. Well, I, that I would have quit. Yeah. But he picked them up on that fourth time and prayed and hauled off and kicked that man in the seat of the britches with his foot and said, I said, run. And the power of God hit that man and he began to run all over that tent. Wow. So, you know, things like that, and he, he, he just nothing that seemed like it ever scared him as right. when I was yeah. a little boy. It, uh, I count on anything. He, he always had a way of seeing God work, and he just believed God no matter what. Amen. You know, we need, we need more, um, I think we need more reckless men of faith. Yes, I uh, had lunch with Oral Roberts, I guess about four months before he died. Right. And uh, he told me, he said, your dad scared me to death. Said, I just knew that they was going to be suing him. Right. And he said, I asked your dad one time, said, how can you all off and hit people like that and break their crutches before you pray for them and, and uh, know that it's going to happen? He says, I just believe God. He said, God said to do it, so I've got to be obedient. Wow. God said to do it, and he just did yeah. it. Yeah. He didn't question it. So. Well, it was, and I know that I, I had heard Oral say a few things as well about your dad. And we're all very complimentary about what's a mighty man of faith, a reckless man of faith that he was. And you know, there was he was, if you if you watch enough, of course there were great healings, but he also was calling the church out of being cold. One of my favorite yeah. quotes I heard of him. He said, "There's snow in the pew, frost in the choir, and a six foot icicle preaching." You know, I and that. I thought, man. He is going after it, you know. He is not letting these people off. And uh, he was he was powerful, powerful man of God that believed God and wanted to see people walk in the full knowledge of who he was. Yeah. Well, he he really wanted to see revival. He did. And he wanted the church to have revival. You but know, it seemed like when you look at the news reports, in fact, there's one photo when he was in jail in Florida for preaching or uh, without a license or what was it? Uh, practicing practicing medicine, medicine without, without a, license. a license. And he's just standing there and he's got the biggest smile on his face. He had a, he believed God so much that the harder you came after him, the bigger the miracles got and the more faith he had. 
the story I was talking about was Miami, Florida. He Miami. went to he went to go, uh, and he had a healing service there. And take the story from there. What happened? Well, uh, the Church of Christ came against him hmm. and wanted to prove that he healing was not for today. Isn't it amazing how many people will fight you to believe in healing? They <laughs> it, it's really amazing. Will. It yeah. really is amazing. People don't, don't want to believe it. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and so they uh, said that they brought a boy through and he told them to take off the crutches and uh, he had polio. And so they, they had all uh, got all of the story together. In fact, I've got all the articles. And in fact, I just found the transcript right. of that uh, trial. But they had people lying to try to put him in jail. And the judge threw it out. Gordon Lindsay, Christ for the Nations, mm -hmm. you know, all of the preachers back in those days came and got together. Instead of fighting one another like they do today and talking bad about each other, preachers worked together back in those days. Right. And I, I like to see people get along, but Amen. there was a power in them coming together. And because they all came together, it filled up the courthouse and they threw the, the court, uh, they threw the charges Jason. out. He won. And they, they even made him a uh, honorary sheriff of Miami yeah, after the trial. About that. Yeah, pr practicing medicine without a license. In fact, if I remember right, it was there is no law against divine healing. That's right. right. And you know, actually, here in America, believe it or not, many hospitals, if you're a chaplain, will not let you offer to pray for people, won't let you do that. I didn't know that. That's true. And uh, they will not let you do that because they feel like you're giving people false hope. And um, it's, it's a sad state of affairs, but it, we haven't learned our lesson yeah. <laughs> as, as humanity to figure that out. Well, I, I think people need hope. They do. There is no such thing as false yeah, hope. Because if you don't have hope, you know, the people right. perish. Amen. And uh, we need to build hope in people. You know, uh, it's, it's just amazing that people don't believe that God can heal today. He still, but you still believe God heals? I Jeff? know he does. Amen. I'm living right Amen. now because of the healing miracles of power of God. I had cancer in my liver, my kidney, and my colon. Right. And doctors gave me six to eight months to live, and that was 33 years ago, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Praise God. And you healed and whole and here today. Yes. That's good. The, um, there's so much more. I mean, as if there wasn't enough about your dad with the great healing and revival ministry that he had, um, he really had a heart for kids. Yes, and he and he started the the orphanage. The way that it was started, he was in a meeting, I believe it was in Wichita Falls, Texas, and a little boy came up to him and pulling on his pant leg after service, and looked up at him and said, "Mister, would you please give me a home?" And that touched my dad's heart right then, and he mm. took the offering that he had and went and put it down on a piece of property in Dallas right. and s started a children's home from that and then moved to Waxahachie later right. with the children's home. And it was, at, that was, while we hear about orphanages all the time now, back then that really was unusual. Orphanages were not that prevalent at the time. So for him to do something like that was quite unusual and, and quite... Uh, surprising to a lot of people. It was, but him being raised in an orphanage and treated bad, he uh, wanted to do that after that little boy has and done And hard for kids. And he yeah. built uh, several buildings out there on the property. Yes. In fact, last night, uh, one of the girls that was raised in the children's home, she was 75, I believe she said, uh, she called me last night and was talking to me. She lives wow. in Mississippi. And she was talking about, you know, her years at the children's home. And then uh, we have a boy named Bobby Davidson. He's a, he's a veteran of the war. He's at the Veterans Hospital right now, called me. He, he's 77. And, but he, he, he'd fight for my dad. Right. Anybody says anything bad about my dad, <laughs> they, yeah. they, he, he's ready to fight them. Yeah. Because what an investment he made, and to this day, 
in those lives. Yeah. Wow. Tremendous. Um, I want to know what happened with you and tell me your ministry. How did you get to where Jack Coe Jr. is today? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> but now uh, I, I grew up in, of course, in the house of minister. And yeah. the last thing I wanted to be was a preacher. Right. And began to doing car sales and just about anything. Worked at a meat packing house. Right. <laughs> and was running from God as fast as I could run. And then one day God got a hold of me and I felt called to preach. And when I started, it was rough. And I found out that uh, people that said if I'd get saved that to help me, they wouldn't help me. Right. And uh, then the ones that did help me, they wanted to use me. And people would call me to come preach, and I didn't want to go preach. And then I told them anyway I was going to die. And God spoke to me one day and said, I will heal you if you'll preach. So where were you when, you, when God spoke to you? I was in the hospital room, yeah, and Baylor Hospital down in Dallas downtown. And, and so, were you just laying there, and you had a vision, or God? Well, just spoke? it wasn't really a vision until I had a friend that had been my friend for a long time, flew in from uh, Granby, Missouri, and then another man that had his church here in Dallas. His name is Sam Nix. Mm -hmm. He came to my hospital room that day, and I was supposed to die in a day or two. In fact, they had called the family together, mm. and they both began to pray for me. Praise God. And they, uh, they prayed different from any other person. I mean, every church, several people, pastors in Dallas came to pray for me. But when they would pray, oh, God, you know, raise him up and heal him. If you don't, we'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah you know, just yeah. more or less no hope prayers. Right. But uh, I remember the prayers that these two prayed. They took authority over the cancer. They took authority over my sickness. Right. And Praise they God. said, in the name of Jesus, we take authority. And Sam Nix went to Miracle Valley, mm -hmm. Arizona, for school and... He uh, knew how. Now, those of you who don't know Miracle Valley, Miracle Valley was A.A. A. Allen. A.A. A. Allen. In fact, a little history. If I, help me if I've got this right. A.A. A. Allen, after your dad passed away, got he got your dad's tent. He bought my dad's bought tent. Bought your dad's tent. And In fact, uh, uh, he bought my dad's tent, and then he got all the chairs. Right. And I've got a chair that went from my dad's tent to... A.A. Uh, a. Allen to Shambach, wow. and Donna Shambach gave me a chair the other Praise day. Praise God, that's awesome. And so I've got the original chair. Tell me one of the miracles that stands out to you in your ministry. Tell me one of them. Well, I had a woman. I didn't know that she got healed until later, but her arm was all bent up mm -hmm. and it could not be moved. It stayed like this. And she found my sister like 20 years later, and everything was working. That's one of the miracles. Wow, wow. Uh, said it was because of your brother praying for me. I was praying for a deaf person one time. <laughs> you know, sometimes you believe it and sometimes you don't. Sure. It's like my dad told the story one time. He said he had a person in the, his line, and he sent them back to the line to the back seven times <laughs> and then they got up nobody else was in line <laughs> and he said oh God what am I going to do now and God said you're not the healer anyway I am Right. and he prayed and God well, healed him good. well this person got was totally deaf and I prayed for him and they I just moved him on and they said she can hear Praise and they, and the first thing I said she can <laughs> <laughs> Tell us one before we go. I want to hear one thing or story about your dad that probably most people don't know. What's the one thing about your dad people you wish people knew about him? Oh, he, a lot of people think that he was rough because of the way he would hit people and all that. I've heard a lot of people say he was rough, but he was the kindest person that there was. He had a heart of compassion. Yeah, and I remember, you know, when I was a little boy and he'd whip me, he said, it hurts me more than it does you. But 
I thought at that time, no, it don't. Give me the belt and let me try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I, I just remember his compassion and his compassion. He, he, he would go and go and go because he wanted to see revival and he thought Jesus was coming so soon yeah. that uh, he had to go like he went. And that's really why he died as a young person is because he didn't feel like he, there was a much time before the Lord would come. I, I just, for a man that only lived to be 38 and overcame all the, all the obstacles he did, what a tremendous legacy that touched not only the people that he was with, but you, and you carried it on to this generation. Thank you. Thank you for being faithful to the call. Well, I want you to know more about, we've only hit some of the highlights of Jack Coe and the ministry that he had, but I want you to go to this website, write this down, jackco.org. And jackco.org, Jack's got a lot of books here. Um, the one that's right here on top is classic collections of Jack Coe Sr., some of his messages. Uh, here's that story about divine healing on trial. And of course, Jack in his own ministry, which we haven't gotten into on this program, um, has books on his own as well. There's all the products there that you can get a hold of and see how you can be a part and partner with Jack Coe. So make sure you do that and be a part. Now, before we go, uh, Jack, I want you to pray for the people. And here's, here's what I want you to pray. There's, I believe today, there's a special anointing on you, just sitting here talking to you, that you have something to impart to the people at home that are sick and need a touch from God. So I want you to look at this camera right Amen. over here and pray for them, pray for their healing. I want you to reach out towards your TV right now. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, those that are sick, cancers, I command you to die. Tumors, I command you to go down. Arthritis healing to flow through those bodies. Lord, every sickness, every disease, every worry, stress, I command it to go in the name of Jesus. Jesus, let your hands be laid upon them right now. Send your angels to minister to those in their house. Those that are discouraged, despondent, feel beat down, lift them up, make them whole. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, sir, for being with me today. Thank you. And last week, it has been such a pleasure. Well, thank, thank you, you for being a part and being uh, faithful. I enjoyed it. Make sure you go to the website, revivalradiotv.com, because there, all of these things God does with revivals, they all blend together. This is the cool thing about God and what He does when He reaches His people. So make sure you go to the website, take part, watch us on Facebook and take part in, in all that we do. Sign up for uh, special videos and releases, and we'll want to make sure we get that to you. So this is Dr. Gene Betty. Thank you. Thank you, Jack Coe. Thanks. And we'll see you next time.